over 25 years, our dedicated and internationally recognized safety consultant, John Miola, has provided safety engineering services and education to the highway maintenance, construction, and other industries. For over a decade, I've had the privilege of working with John personally as he has provided his targeted safety advice to the power sweeping industry by American Sweeper, which is now, because of growth, become World Sweeper. And, uh, the uh, worldsweeper.com website and the World Sweeping Association. In addition to the last year, John has been providing the members of the World Sweeping Association with a monthly safety bulletin designed to maximize the safety of those in our industry. And for that, I would like to uh, present him with a certificate that says thank you for being our 2015 safety, safety consultants. to our gracious host, Pavement Today, and ForConstructionPros.com, several other trade publications. He's also an adjunct instructor in safety engineering at the Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond. His official title is Safety Director for Pillar Engineers, an interstate highway maintenance specialist that are located in Richmond and Wyattville, Virginia. And it is with great pleasure that on behalf of our World Sweeping Association, I introduce you to John Miola. And uh, I'll take a picture later. Okay, okay. fantastic. Thank All right, round of applause. Give this man a lot to Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I've known Range for a long time and, and been associated with the industry. And I can tell you, the services that we provide, it's it's a tough business. It's not an easy business. You know that. But we've kind of grown up, and we've seen technological improvements. We've seen. Uh, um, administrative, we've seen legal, we've seen equipment, a lot of equipment improvements. Well, we've also seen a huge increase in safety awareness and prevention measures. So the folks that run the conference said, Miola, come to the conference, share some of this, give us some ideas. You've got to realize that the industry we re represent is it's it's a huge industry and we're in and it's dominated by smaller companies of of zero to fifty zero to seventy five um, you know it's mom and pop well there's a lot of things happening right now we've got a generational shift going on in a lot of cases where the the, the mom and dad that worked really hard in the fifties and sixties and seventies they kind of spend in the winters in Florida now and the next generation's taking over and trying to move the company forward. I see this a lot. I've got clients in Richmond, Virginia, where it's father to son or father to sons, and there's some generational conflicts going on, such as, well, well, why do we need that safety stuff? Well, we never had that before. We don't need that safety stuff. Well, well the younger generation has been jobs where it's saying, don't even bid this job unless you've got a safety program that is on steroids. Don't come in here with a book with some piece of paper and some dog-eared stuff and say, yeah, that's my program. We want to see, these are the customers that are asking for it. And by the customers, I'm talking about uh, Dominion Power, uh, Healthcare Corp HCA, uh, uh, people that are building big complexes, big earthwork projects, a lot of pavement. A lot of uh, uh, striping going in, huge parking lots, uh, multi-year developments in some cases. These are the people that are asking it. Uh, Mineral Sands Mine in Stony Creek, uh, Virginia. They're mining the banks of the Nottoway River. It's an Australian mining company that told my guy, the biggest dirt mover in Virginia, he says, don't even come in here unless you've got a safety program that meets ISO 9000 or ISO 33000 standards, which is a very tough standard to have, and he's got to, he's got to do that. And the guy had a few pieces of paper, and he did his first aid training, and he did a few things. He said, Mio, oh, I, I can't survive with this. I need to take it to the next level. So our industry is going through a little bit of generational shift. It's mostly good. <clears throat> we'll come out of it stronger. The folks that are paying attention, the folks that came to this seminar today are going to be learning some of the techniques to go make this go forward on the new set of rules. And I can tell you they were driven by a lot of motivation. Some of it was regulatory. If you have questions and they can be brief, you can shout them out. 
If you want to wait till the end, we'll try to leave some time to talk. See if we bounce forward. Can we go forward? If you need the the, the roster of like today's program, where's my book? No, the other book. Oh, right here. If you read the roster of the conference programs, the word best practices appears like three or four times. The word leadership, the word safety appears three or four times. I just made a, made a laundry list myself that the industry recognizes and is addressing. Danny, we went overboard. Let's look at it. It's oversized. Can we shrink it down? Is that, is that better? Okay. Yeah, best practices, you'll see it represented. There's like eight or ten sessions devoted. How about night work? There's a whole session devoted to night work. And I can tell you, if you are doing night work, your safety program needs to be beyond just the basic nine to five daytime guy. Because night work brings in a whole separate set of safety factors to be aware of. Uh, we'll touch on them briefly. But these are the things that have been identified. Bilingual. One of the folks already asked about bilingual, and there's links been built in. Uh, now, they're not you know, clickable links, obviously, in this book, but there are links. Everything is out there on the internet that you just need to use a, a very fine sieve to get to the right stuff. But uh, bilingual safety information, we hear that a lot, saying, hey, how am I going to translate this for my folks? It's already done for you. The links are there, and we're going to look at them very briefly. Um, but those state plans, actually, I think uh, New York State Insurance Fund, uh, Florida, California, and I believe Ohio has done a phenomenal job translating all of their safety, safety meeting topics, safety manuals, regulatory information. It's all been translated. Uh, I think. I think we've got, okay, this is basically introduction. We weren't going to spend a lot of time. Does everyone understand what their insurance EMF is? Experience modification factor. It's, it's a big dollar sign in your organization. And, and the fewer accidents that you have, and the fewer that you report to your insurance company, the lower you push that EMF, that, that factor. You want it definitely below 1.0. 1.0 is the break-even point where your customer is going to look at your certified copy of your modification. We just did trade one yesterday. We had a trade one proof of coverage and, and our insurance mod, uh the customer is going to scrutinize if your mod is over 1.0, it means you are paying more for your workers' comp insurance than you have to. It's because of your lousy experience. So the goal in life for the safety program, as one of the several goals, is to drive that mod down by you not having accidents. And by you minimizing the cost of those accidents, which you can do in a lot of ways. Let's face it, you keep reporting, you know, Jethro got something in his eye and ripped and this guy fell and none of them were hurt bad, but they all, they all went to the emergency room. It was all something. Man, who was bleeding? Who got stitches? Well, let me tell you, if that happens more than a few times, the underwriter that writes your insurance bill is going to have some questions. And, and the guy that calculates your insurance mod, there's a group in Get this, Boca Raton, Florida, that calculates your insurance mod. Who's from Boca Raton, anybody? I don't want to insult Boca Raton unduly, but there's a lot of scams in South Florida. If that's the last place that I would want anybody calculating, nothing to do with my mod. Anyway, that's where they calculate. It's called the NCCI, and I'm sure it's all legitimate, <coughs> but that's where they do it. It's NCCI. And they calculate, National Council on Compensation Insurers, that's where they grind up all the numbers and they say, what is your business? Well, I do a little paving, I do a little sweeping, I do some striping. Oh, okay, you should be paying 
$100 per $10,000 of payroll, or whatever the factor is. If you've got lousy performance, lousy experience, they say instead of $100, you are going to pay $500, or a big factor thereof, and that's what blows your motto. When your customer sees this, he says, you're a turkey. You're, you're paying way more than you have to. It tells me two things. Number one, your bid is going to be higher because you've got to pay for this exorbitant insurance, insurance bill. But number two, you're having too many accidents. And I'm not letting you come on my job if you're going to have an accident, which you're likely to do with this track record. So you do this, you have a safety program for a lot of reasons. This one shows, this one here can pay back. This one here, you keep it for compliance, that at least keeps you off the OSHA radar screen so you will not get a speeding ticket from the safety police, whether it's the federal OSHA or your state plan, your state. Uh, and like I say, Tennessee, uh, let me tell you what Virginia has done. Virginia, really smart guys. They're very, very, they, they're, they're tough, but they're fair. What they did, OSHA, is everyone aware that OSHA just changed their uh, reporting requirements? This was kind of news we filtered around the industry a little bit. Um, I think it was of January 1, they started, if you have a fatality or a hospitalization or, there's three categories. Like if somebody gets hurt really bad, you, you got to call OSHA or your state and report that. You can't just ignore it. Within eight hours, thank you. This what? Used to be three days. Yeah, used to be three days. They used to give you 72 hours. Now it's, they, they bumped it up. Here's what Virginia did, and I think Maryland also. Uh, they said they went to the emergency rooms, of which is governed by the medical people. They went to the emergency rooms and calls up the doctors and says, hey, if somebody walks in here with a really bad accident, bad injury, missing a limb, or crushed, or broke, or burned, you call me up. And now they got the doctors, and the medical administrators, and they love following rules, because they bill for that. So, so, you, so in other words, you're not getting away with it. If your guy gets hurt one way or the other, the safety police are going to know. And depending on what it is, your phone's going to ring, or your doorbell is going to ring. And they're going to come and introduce and do an inspection. And there's a whole protocol associated with that. That will be the topic for next year's seminar, maybe. But just suffice to say, uh, that's what's going to happen increasingly. Because they've got this stuff now called information technology that lets people talk to one another from far away. Everything is going to be out in the open. In other words, you can't hide that stuff. If somebody gets hurt, they get treated, bada bing, it's going to be there. Go ahead, Dan. Go ahead, next one. I'm going to move kind of quickly because we've got you know a fair amount to follow. Um, does everyone have some semblance or form of a safety manual? How many folks have a, a real manual? That's a good. That's a good chunk. I'm proud of you. Thank you. I can tell you most safety manuals are very high grade wallpaper. They sit there, they look good. Uh, usually the only people that really look at them is like the insurance guy when he shows up, maybe your worker's comp order. Um, you know, you take it out, you show it off, you look, it looks good. And that's fine, that's most of them, that's all they need to be. If you were making lawn chairs or you were in a very low risk business, that's all you need. The business we're in, the manual is just the starting point for our program. The manual is kind of the centerpiece, the hood ornament, for our entire program. Let me ask you this. How many folks have some form of uh, recognition event, such as uh, summer picnic, Christmas party, uh, hot dog, pizza, Rose, anything? Anybody? One, two, three, okay, that's better. Good, good. Those events, believe it or not, form a very important part of your overall program. So we've got the manual with all the books, the rules, the regs, the, the codified stuff, 
the policy. You need to have this stuff. It's called, uh, all, and there's a lot of names for it, regulatory, administrative. Depending on where you are, such as like if you're in a highly urbanized area, or you're working in sensitive or highly public locations, your safety manual forms a big block of what's called defensive paper. Defensive paper. And what that means is if something bad happens and somebody's coming after you, the lawyer, the regulatory, the other insurance guy, you need to defend yourself. You reach for that book. And that's the time that you're going to wish you had stayed up later at night, keeping it more up to date, to say, we revised it. We Look at that. Look at all oh, last week. We put a new chapter. Anything. And, and I've been in that scenario enough times to know. Let me tell you, that book can sit on that shelf and stay there perfect. You just keep adding sticky notes to it. You keep stuffing stuff in the back of it. You keep putting notes, emails, the, the, the snot gram you got from your insurance company, you put that in there. You make that manual the file, the book. And you want it as big so that you need two hands to hold that file. That's what you really want. That's your safety manual. Because I've done so many audits for insurance companies, I know when I walk in the door, I'll say, can I see a safety pro copy of your safety, pro safety manual, please? Or do you have a safety manual? Oh, yes, of course. Can I see a copy? Oh, yeah, right here. They just reach, pull, pull it off the shelf. That book, that is, they've been touched in a year. The same nice, neat, loosely binder covered with dust. Looks good, put the name, on it. okay, good. That book hasn't been opened, touched, modified, nothing. And I know right then that I'm looking at a paper program. So I gotta work a little harder and push. And most people, you know, we come somewhere in the middle. But when that guy pulls that thing off the shelf and it's a binder and stuff's falling out of it, I know that that's been a working document. He just put the attendance list, the sign-up sheet from his attendance list from his last toolbox safety meeting. He just shoved it in there. He didn't actually take the time to open it and go in and locate it. He just shoved it in there and that's fine. That shows that book is working. Now, you can do it electronically as well, but now you've got to digitize the signing page, you've got to move it around, you've got to have a file, and it's harder to reproduce. When it comes to defensive paper, which is really important for us, you want to pull that off so that the weight of that volume goes thump on the desk, that you actually hit the desk with it. Because when that other lawyer sees it, in your lawyer's hands, usually, he's going to go, uh, uh, well, maybe they weren't all, maybe they weren't 100% negligent. Virginia has comparative negligence. If you can show that the other guy was 50% negligent and you did your job, you're off the hook by, you know, that much more. So you want the defensive paper. You want receipts, emails. You want to show, you want a copy of this guy. <clears throat> You want a copy of this in your manual. Now, this is not a regulatory section, but it shows that you did your job. You went out of your way. You tried to learn. You tried to improve. We haven't even talked about paving yet, but that's part of This is just the paper side. Some of the other resources, any, uh, yeah, some of the other resources the guys we're here with today, Pavement, uh, uh, Pavement Magazine, Pavement Today, the, uh, the sweeping, whatever your, uh, uh, we're with the sweeping group, but there's others for pavers, there's for stripers, there's associations all around. Associations big and small. We, we recommend that you not only join it, but that you actively participate in whatever association or trade group or, or local club. We've got the American Society of Safety Engineers in Richmond. That, that we've got people that walk in, Branscombe Paving. Branscombe sends their guy to, to our, our safety meetings. Uh, it shows your involvement in the program. 
It shows that you took time out of your schedule. Now, I say you. <coughs> Delegate. How many folks have the luxury of having a dedicated safety officer? See what I mean? It's like three. It's hard. Maybe you are the safety officer. Well, that's fine. But I'm, what I'm trying to point out is that the diversity of sources and the diversity of resources is, 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 is use a little creativity. And usually one will lead to another. A lot of the information, the best information for our industry comes not from OSHA, not from the regulatory guys, not from the insurance people. It comes from our industry. Remember I said uh, Vosch went and made the law for tree trimming? Before they made the law, they called the Arborist Society, they called the, the, the uh, Green, uh, what do you call it, the, uh, the Landscaping Society, they called all these groups and they said, hey guys, we're writing a law one way or the other, whether you like it or not. The reason we're calling you today is would you like to have a seat at the table? when we write the law, and my guys are, oh, well, yeah, we're there, we'll be, of course we'll be there. And most of the stuff they said, if you go buy a chainsaw and you read the safety part of the manual, that's all they said. They said, they, just put that in there. We're not going to ask you to paint it gold trim or do whatever. We're just going to ask you to make sure that guy, before he starts it up, reads that part of the book, or you at least teach it to him. And if he doesn't speak English, you taught him in his own language. And if he's going to wear chaps, you're going to buy him those chaps and put them on. And, and, and the industry said, well, well, uh, okay, I think we can do that. Yeah, yeah, no problem. As if to say, yeah, we can do the bare minimum that the, that the law says and the manufacturer says. Why do you think the manufacturer put it in his manual? Let's think about that. Who runs Elgin Sweepers? <coughs> I got news for you. Elgin Sweepers just wrote a safety manual for their sweepers. And it was a function of them having been sued so many times that they needed a chunk of defensive paper. They just wrote the safety manual for it. Steel chainsaws, pool and chainsaws, those manuals are loaded with uh, uh, pictures, pictorials that show right, wrong, and different good practice, etc. That's their version of defensive paper. The moral of our story is for your safety manual is you want it to be that same little instructorial manual that they do for theirs, you want it for your company, for your operation. And if you do a little bit special and a little bit custom, your manual has a little bit special and a little bit custom. But I can tell you 70% 70% of that manual is going to be OSHA, uh, new employee safety orientation, bedrock stuff, be out there. I can tell you, the top, the top 10 list for your safety manual, we cited at the top of my head, company policy, company policy, in writing. It can't be, everybody knows we're tough on safety. That's not a policy. It's got to be in writing. You can put in writing, everybody knows we're safe, but it's got to be there. You, you actually say it. You say that the culture of our company is that you will not take chances. You put it in writing, that's your policy. Defensive paper, fantastic. Next section, uh, new employee orientation. Every employee comes to work for our company, you will receive an orientation from an uh, experienced person, and the orientation will consist of, there's like seven or eight top ten lists to go through. Next section, uh, who is OSHA? And let me tell you, that is one of the most overlooked sections in safety manuals. Who is OSHA and who is Vosh? The state guy, whether it's Tennessee or, or whomever. But you, you put in there, it's the equivalent of, uh, how, how would you say it? It's the equivalent of like me coming to your house and, and you'll say, here's the menu for tonight, here's what we're gonna have for dinner. And by the way, here's uh, uh, John Miola's special plate right here. Miola, you're my guest, you're gonna have, you, you at least took the courtesy to put, the guy who wrote the rules is OSHA. I mean, they're the people who are gonna give you the fine if you don't follow that rule. At least you put his name, or Vosh. Vosh has another, here's, this is instructive. Vosh has another one of those, they call them, um, 
state unique standards, unique standards. That's what Virginia calls them. Every state calls them different names. It means the standards they wrote themselves over and above OSHA. Remember we said they did the one on tree trimming? And there's about 60 slides, PowerPoint slides. It's all free online, you can download it, and it's a good standard. I wrote another one before that, two years before that. Backing up. They were having so many fatalities from backing up. It is the number two most prevalent motor vehicle accident, is reverse operations, backing up, number two. So many people were getting killed. I'm talking about rotor mill and, 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 and uh, vibratory mo motor graders and, and rollers, you name it. So many people were getting killed. Ten wheel dumps backing over supervisors all day long. Uh, so many people were getting killed that Virginia said, we are going to exercise our privilege to write a law on our own over and above OSHA, and they did. And it's really simple. It is in, it's two pages simple. Guess what happened to the number of fatalities from backing accidents following implementation of the law? You said it earlier, 50%. If you were one of the 50%, you were saying Hail Marys. You'd be saying Hosannas, because you lived. They cut the number of fatalities in half. The rule is real simple. It says if you're going to back up that truck, if it's number one, if it's what's called a, uh, they call it a, um, a covered, is it, what is it? Obstructed view. Obstructed view, if it's a covered vehicle, meaning covered under the standard, applicable under the standard. If any vehicle with an obstructed view to the rear, meaning that driver can't see right out the back, that's a lot, that's a lot of iron. I mean, that's backhoes and, and, and you know, every kind of, you know, machinery tracked, rubber tired, pavers, 10 wheel dumps, it goes on and on. So it says if you've got a covered vehicle and you've got to back that rig up, two things. One of two things has to happen. You either get, out, get your fanny out of that seat and go look before you back to make sure it's clear, or, or what? You have a spotter. And, and these guys were so precise. The rule for the spotter, the spotter has to have high visibility apparel, not go behind the vehicle, not allow anyone else to go behind them. You know, it's a little, it's like two pages. It's the simplest thing. And in Virginia, much to their credit, they even gave another pass. They said, if you first arrive at the place of, of uh, work area, if you first arrive and you have to back in, well, obviously, you've just arrived. You can see that the area you're going to back is clear. You can back up without having to get out and look or without a spot. They didn't met, met them halfway. And that's like, you know, 40, 50% of all of the, the backing. The truck comes in, he can see, he backs in, he's fine. But anyone else, you've got to have a spotter or you've got to get out and look. God forbid, you've got to get out of the cab, get it on and go look. So, so Virginia did that. In your safety manual, it should reference whatever your state, and I think we have a website where we're going to switch. We've got to switch programs. Come on. It's a good thing Danny's got a degree from Virginia Tech. He's really smart. He can try to open one of these websites. I just want to show you how, how easy it is if you click on the, the Google, then one of these. That's it. That, oh. Well, see, now you've got to switch Which one? the screen. <laughs> control. <laughs> yeah, control. Keep talking. I'll figure it out. But I, I, I just want to show you, and I think the link is in here. You can, you can highlight it where it says Tennessee is a state plan state. That's one of them, but there's a link. It's either further in. You can Google it for that matter. You can go to OSHA. Here it is. Yeah, right there. That's it. That's it. That's it. Right there. Uh, this is, uh, this is, uh, what's it say? Oh, this is Tennessee. This is the OSHA page. OSHA has a page right here. This is an OSHA page that tells you uh, how do I find a, a state plan. You, oh, right there, there's a map. There, yeah, make it easy. See it? There's the ones. There's Tennessee. Look at it. Tennessee, Kentucky. See it? Indiana. 
is about half the states that have it. If you have not already done so, go to this page, research what your state has, and I guarantee you the states, see they get money from OSHA to do this, so it's not like a bare bones deal. When they do it, they usually do a good job. They put the program online, sometimes bilingual. All you have to do is click on it, download it, just like we said, print a copy, stick it in your safety manual, you're covered. It shows that you took the time to actually go and look at the guy and talk to him and acknowledge that OSHA or, or, or Tennessee or this is North Carolina. Um, it shows that you've done your homework. It's kind of a courtesy. Now think about this. These are the guys that are going to come to do an audit on your program. It's kind of like having a copy of the IRS rules in your tax manual, so that when you do the audit, at least you say, hey guys, look, I was playing by your rules. Here they are. I even downloaded a copy. They love it when they see that. <clears throat> How many folks have taken the OSHA 10 hour? That's good. That's good. Do you remember when you took the OSHA 10 hour, how many hours were spent talking about OSHA? And I can tell you, if you don't remember, depending on when you took it, there was at least one hour. One of the 10 hours was spent talking about OSHA, their inspection policy, their complaint procedure, their fine structure, how you can contest a hearing. That was one hour. They revised it as of a year and a half ago. Now, if you take the course, there's a minimum of two hours of talking about OSHA. So if you take the 10 hour course, two hours, 20% is on how OSHA works, who they are, what they do, and if you have a state plan, that's included in there. So it's kind of like the regulatory part of it. Now you are not going to learn much about preventing an accident from two hours worth of talking about OSHA. However, they are the safety police, they make the rules, it is the federal government, we pay taxes, so you might as well <laughs> you know, play ball and do the, do the rule and do whatever, but uh, that's, how, that's how serious they are about enforcing the safety rules. And I can tell you right now, uh, they're really paranoid about any form of retaliation against an employee for filing a complaint or uh, bringing up a safety problem. They're really, there was just some big case that they got decided where, um, I, I forget who it was, it was, uh, I don't know, it was either the airport worker or a baggage, I forget, but there was a big claim and they, they settled it and they filed and they just kept going more. So uh, it, it helps to stay, yeah, this is kind of one of their, one of their, uh, Got a web page. Here are some of the industries. You can see some of the industries that, well, right here. Oh, this one, yeah, it was uh, Commuter North. He got hurt and reported the injury, and the supervisor was driving him to the emergency room and threatened the guy. He said, If you report this, I'm going to get demoted, you're going to get demoted, we're all going to get in trouble. And the guy felt threatened and he reported it to the feds, and there was a big mess. Uh, but you can see here's uh, different, here's Hannaford Nuclear, here's uh, Mail Handers, so it does happen. Anyway, it just shows, even if you print the page and stick it in the book, it shows at least that you've done it. And you say, yeah, we talked about this in our safety meeting. And you should. How many folks hold regular safety meetings? Fantastic. Every hand in the room should go up. So we've got the safety manual, we've got uh, uh, employer orientation, we've got your policy, we've got meetings going on. This is kind of forming out our top ten list. Yes, sir? How often should you do that, that whole regular safety meeting? You know, I, that's, a, that's, that, that's the $64,000 question. We recommend minimum monthly. Minimum. Absolute minimum monthly. With you know, depending on the level of risk, of, of, of its high risk, like steel erection or crane or heavy hauling or 
uh, a lot of machinery moving around, big machinery, road paving jobs, weekly. Really high risk, high technical, high hazard, fall protection, confined space, daily. It's key to the level of risk. Minimum for most, monthly. Probably your guys, more than likely, they get together before doing some crazy interchange or some oddball thing. They're going to get together and either talk on the phone. I like to grab the guys and do a lot of snow removal with a dozen or more trucks. If we were going to do some oddball interchange, I'd get them out of the truck and look at them and say, you're going to do the left lane. You got, yeah. You're going to do the right lane. Yeah. You're in the middle. Yeah. You're putting your blade this way, that way. The troopers here, the troopers there. We can talk it all out. So you know how things get lost on the radio and on the phone. They don't understand you. And nobody wants to say, I didn't hear you. I don't know what to do. Make sure everybody knew what to do. Um, they're probably doing that already. Hopefully they are. And if they are, write it down. Me, Joe, Ted, and Fred met for 10 minutes and talked about hitting this interchange. 15 minutes, blah, 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 signed it. Defensive paper. Write it down. Get a guy to sign it. Anytime you bring, I don't care if it's three people, you bring them together, that's a safety meeting, have a signature, or at least make a note of it. Even if they don't sign, just make a note. We had the meeting. Defensive paper. Anyway, right here, 75%, maybe 60, 65, 75% is standard paper, PPE. New employee orientation, PPE section. Jethro, you got to wear your hard hat, you got to wear steel toes, you got to wear a safety vest. It's got to be in writing. Uh, um, HAZCOM, hazard communication. If I had to name probably one of the most useless standards out there, I'd probably have to point to that. It takes up time, takes up energy, people talk about it, gamble about it, a lot of stuff. It is the number one most heavily cited of all the OSHA standards, hazard communication. Are we in the chemical business? Yes. Are we? I mean, what, asphalt, liquid asphalt, spray paint, tackle? Not really. I mean, if we were making, you know, some exotic methyl isocyanate or doing something horrible, I'd say, holy crap, yeah, we gotta be doing it. Has come to us, we need to do it, okay? Uh, I'm not saying we can't. You need to do it, but it's it's like oversized importance. Anyway, they just changed the law a little bit on HASCOM a couple of years ago. It's now called what? Show me how careful you guys are. Was it called what? Come on, hear me. GHS stands for what? Da 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 da. I'm a little disappointed. You guys got to stay up on this. Globally harmonized standard. And basically what they did was they took the same law and they said, we're going to change the labels. The labels on all of your cans of paint and glue and whatever. We don't use a lot of this stuff. But now the, the, the label has to show the little picture of whatever the hazard is. If it's flammable, there's fire. If it's explosive, there's explosive. If it's breathing, they show nose. But it's got to show that. That's called globally harmonized standard, and it's because there's some people that can't read, so they put a picture. It makes sense. That's part of the new standard. And we're supposed to do training on this. You can do it at your safety meeting. Take 20 minutes. Say, look, guys, here's a picture of the new standard, picture of the new labels. One other thing they changed. Remember the thing called the MSDS, Material Safety Data Sheet? You know, I mean, it's the government. They do things for whatever reason. They changed the name of that document. It's now called SDS, Safety Data Sheet. They dropped the word material. And it's kind of like, do I need to know this? So what? You change. So what do I? It's part of the law that says we must train our people to say, we don't call it MSDS anymore, we call it safety data sheet. Jethro, you got that? Yeah, boss, I got it, no, safety data sheet, fine. The sheet's the same, the paper's the same. If you Google it, WD-40, you download the data sheet, it's the same paper, only the name is different and we are required to go back to our people and train them and say, listen, from now on, don't call it MSDS, show how intelligent we are. If we get an inspection, they come in here and say, 
<coughs> where's the data sheet for your bottle of, of, of alcohol? Well, it's right here, boss. All we need to call it safety data sheet now. And you show that you are ahead of the curve and learning. And by the way, there's a section in our manual that says we're up to date on this. Anyway, that's one of the sections right here. One of the sections of this 75%. So we've got um, new employee orientation, we've got PPE, we've got HASCOM. What's another one? Bedrock. It's got to be in there. It's got to have it. Pick one. There's 20 of them. Lockout, tagout. I can tell you, you're running hydraulic excavator, hydraulic machinery, back hose, track hose, anything with rubber tire tracks, anything like that. Hydraulic. You need to have a section in the book, lockout, tagout. Real simple. Most people hear lockout, tagout, and they hear the word, uh, they, they, think, they think this stuff, right? Electricity. Electricity is one of the five principal energy types covered under the lockout, tagout standard. There are five, hydraulic, pneumatic, chemical, thermal, cryogenic, but electrical obviously is the one that gets a lot of play because that's the one that's gonna bite you and knock you on your fin. But hydraulic, in our business actually, hydraulic probably bites more people. How about the one where the dump truck bed goes up like this and somebody gets under there to check something and now the bed goes, does this? You know how often that happens? Now they put the crutch, they put the safety crutch, but that was only in the last five, seven years. There's a lot of rigs out there that don't have that. And a lot of guys take the chance, they want to either check an air cylinder or hose or whatever. That's actually a form of lockout tagger. Uh, raised dump, raised, raised buckets, raised hoppers. If it goes up on hydraulics, no one is supposed to go under the, I mean, bl seals blow out. You know this, how often seals blow out without warning. Um, that's a form, so that's another section in your safety manual. Another section that should be in there that is not actually a, an OSHA code. How many folks teach as part of their orientation how to use a long-handled tool, how to shovel. Think about it. It is the number one cause of, of low back strain, uh, um, uh, uh, any kind of, uh, dis uh, they call it uh, MSD, musculoskeletal disorders. If you fill out your OSHA log, there's a specific category on that page that says, was this an MSD injury, musculoskeletal, <coughs> soft tissue injury. It is the, one of the leading causes. It's up there, it's, 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 it, I think it is the top. But if, if, if we're smart, we'll have a section in the manual called ergonomics. Minimum, how to stand when you are shoveling dense materials. Now you know this, if you stick that shovel in that pile the wrong way, you're going to pay for it. You're going to stand up like on an angle because you've just compressed something or squished something or vertebral. So, so it's worth the extra few minutes to demonstrate to someone who's unfamiliar or even as a reminder, here's how you stick that shovel in a pile. Here's how you squat low to use your body force and mechanics to lift. You don't try to do it from standing back here, you get up close. Number one, you try to avoid doing this as opposed to this, which is a much stronger ergonomic and more benign to scoop rather than push. You're reversing the load on your muscular geometry. So those are things that should form OSHA really doesn't care if that section's in your manual. You know who cares if that's in there? The insurance guy. Because he pays the claim. And you will ultimately, so get through your premium. But that's another uh, element there. I can tell you 
that everything we've talked about up till now is aimed at what's called workers' comp, prevention of injuries to occupational to people and workers. Unfortunately, the biggest category of loss in our industry has got nothing to do with that. It's kind of under the radar. And this should be the next section in your safety manual. <coughs> right about now, I've been writing on, oh, they did bring me something else. Do we have a pen? Do we have ink pen? <laughs> Here, I'll give you a hint. I'll give you a hint. Here's the initials. DD, and if it's uh, National Safety Council, it's called DDC. DD, how about it? Defensive driving. Defensive driving. The number one cause of loss in our business has got nothing to do with people getting hurt. Automobile loss. Fender benders. To and from work. We're not even on the job. And we're having tailgate. So the next section in our manual, if we're smart, is going to say a little bit on defensive driving. And this breaks down into two rules. There's two rules to follow on defensive driving. Number, and, they, and they're both derived from the frequency of crashes in those categories. Number one is following, he already said it, following too close. The number one cause of automobile accident following too close, tailgate. A lot of different names for it. Somewhere in your manual, there needs to be a line that says, if you're going to drive our company truck, you need to be staying a minimum of, we use four seconds, four seconds of following distance. You need to be staying four seconds back. It's got to say that. Now, I can tell you, every person, human person that drives, we've got our own personality, our own belief system. We grew up learning to drive one way. It's really hard to change that behavior. If your comfort zone is one car length, mm, I would take the keys away. It's really hard to change a person's behavior. If they're going to follow too close, that's just the way they drive. You don't want that person in your insured vehicle. So you either supervise them into that four second rule or do something, but that's got to be your company mantra. Because you don't want to be in that category of loss. That's a big category. <clears throat> Following too close, rear end accidents. And I can tell you where it happens the most. Intersections of all type. Everything from cloverleaf to interchange to on-ramp to bank parking lot to Walmart. God forbid. Walmart, one huge intersection. That's where those accidents are occurring. And I mean, statistically, the insurance company will, this is insurance, this is, that's where they, the numbers come from. Okay, number two, so that's number one, following too close, you do your job, you say, if I catch you following too close, you know, we're going to have a talk and yada yada. But you, you make it and you show by example, and especially if we're towing equipment and we got a, a roller on the trailer or whatever, and garden trailers and overloaded stuff and 10 wheel dumps and intersections. And so we make sure, we've got number one. Who do we need to take a guess? Number two. Backing up. We already talk about it. Backing up. Bada bing, backing up. The number two, backing up. Low speed, low damage, but the frequency, bingo. It's up there. It's the number two category. So if we're smart, our defensive driving program is going to talk about following too close and the category is not to say, you know, be careful when you're backing up. If we're smart, what we'll say is use defensive parking. Defensive parking. Park so we do not have to back up. Park so we do not have to, we can drive through, we can drive up. And if you want extra points for coming to the conference today, you go so far as to do the unimaginable and say, Jethro, put a cone in the back of your parked vehicle. Define the presence of your vehicle with a cone. And you say, well, what do I do that for? Think about it. Who does that? 
The people with a big dog in that fight, the people who have a lot to risk, go to that extra level. How, now let's think about this. How much does a cone cost? Do you already have cones? Duh, duh. So what are we talking here? A little bit of procedure to say, come on guys, there's three of you guys on this truck, you're going for coffee, you stop, you park, put the cone there. The cone defines your vehicle as a live, attended work vehicle, subject to movement, subject to being worked on. It protects your presence, keeps people away. That's why you want the cone. That's for extra bonus credit, because there's no law that says we do that. But if we can learn from those really smart people that suck up a lot of my money, which is Comcast and the utility guys and all these people, those are the ones that have learned the lesson. So we've got defensive, we've got ergonomics, defensive driving. What's another one that we think should be in there? These are just the standard bedrock, 75%. Okay, we've named about six. Uh, I think they're in the book somewhere. So we get to the point now where we're going to say, well, gee whiz, this is all the standard stuff. I can tell you what should be the next section in the manual. As many different pieces of equipment that you own. I don't care if you take your cell phone and go take a picture of the machine and a picture of the nameplate, and a picture of the specification plate, and put that in the book. That's your something on that machine. That is called a machine-specific safety portion. Machine-specific. Because ergonomics is ergonomics to everybody. Defensive driving is defensive driving to everybody. But if you're using the, the, the BOMAG, what do they make? Rollers or compactors or, or what are they? Whatever, whatever specific machine you are using, curb and gutter. Danny, what, are they, what is that machine? Slip form, slip form, slip form gutter, gutter. If you're using that machine, you take that manual and either photocopy it or download it. They're all in there. And that, you put that, and that's your section on that specific machine. And the next time you do your safety meeting, which could be weekly or monthly, however, you'll say, hey guys, not for nothing but, I know it's going to be boring, but we're going to run through this manual really quick. And I don't care if you just hold it up and point to the pictures, of which there are a lot of graphics, pictorials, diagrams, of fingers getting pinched, and feet getting ripped into augers, and, 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 and all or electronic or, or hydraulic fittings blown loose, They've pictorialized that. That's your material for your safety manual. So you do it, you have people sign defensive paper. And you've got the manual in your book. Now, if you've got 10 wheel dumps and, and you know, five ton dumps and common variety trailers, I can tell you trailers, as many different trailers as you use, if you use a lot of trailers, you need to be having a little specific trailer safety reminder program. Did we not have... Oh, every week. I mean, we had trailers in like nine states, 22 projects, message boards, everything was towed. Message boards, uh, arrow boards, uh, uh, garden trailers, overloaded, just you name it. It was just all kinds, and, and invariably, every hitch. Every connection, every whatever, I can tell you, if you've got trailers, a couple of bedrock truths, you make sure that on the back of that trailer, you have as much conspicuity, DOT conspicuity tape as you can humanly glue on there. I mean, create spaces to put on the back of that trailer, because you are basically protecting your fanny with defensive paper against somebody running up on you. Let's go back and shift gears a minute. John, can I ask you to pause in with sometime within the next five minutes? You want to pause? I just want to change out the tape is all. Be, I don't know if we can stand it. No, it'd be a 30 second pause. These guys have to stay in the room. <laughs> yeah. no, you can't leave Nashville. Okay, one, two, three, pause. 30 second pause. 
I can tell you their website is, is pretty well composed, very actively edited. Rangers exemplary in doing the job that we talked about earlier, saying join your trade association, join the group that's going to represent you. He stays on top of regulatory trends, of things affecting the industry, of contractors getting hosed by some client that didn't pay or went bankrupt or whatever, tries to represent, gives you a clue to what to look for. Now, if you're running a fleet of sweepers and that's your, that's your field, you want to be looking at that website. If you're in a different paving or whichever, you may have a different venue, but that's how you learn. Okay, back to what we were saying. Here's on your question for your uh, safety meetings. Danny, did you skip a page? Nothing. No, no, go back. Oh, yeah, no, okay, yeah. Yeah, that's it, that's it, okay. Yeah, right here, monthly safety meetings are minimum, what we said. See it? Try to make it the same date, time, time, and place. Uh, always try to get, some, uh, get a signature. If we're doing paving, sweeping, striping, the ante is a little higher, so we're suggesting weekly tailgate. On complex job sites, high hazard, we're saying daily or pre-work. And I can tell you, when the crane riggers were getting ready to make a critical pick, that meeting was right then at the site before they hoisted this thing off the ground. Um, task training, let's get one thing clear. A safety meeting is not safety training. Training is a specific, discrete interval of, of review of educational material that usually, you know, presented in an educational format, usually with a lesson plan, usually following an outline, usually with a book or a manual. That's safety training. <coughs> say, say, for example, uh, um, OSHA requires operator training or competency. Well, those are separate. That's not a safety meeting. A safety meeting is a brief exchange of information to confirm this is our plan, this is what we're going to do, this is what's coming up. Uh, hey, it's getting cold, it may talk about seasonal, but it is not safety training. Safety training is a separate little adventure that, that, that you have to do in some cases. It doesn't need to be complicated, it doesn't need to take a day, you can do most safety training. Most of the training for our industry, you can do officially in an hour. If you have a plan, if you have some materials, maybe you've got a YouTube video, an hour. Two hours tops. Anything more than that, and they're kind of going overboard. Uh, fall protection, confined space entry, okay. Those are half-day courses. At the action level, most here's a, here's a safety tip. A lot of people lose sight of this. Most of the safety regulations up there, we talked about lockout, tagout, um, HASCOM to some extent, those are action level, action level standards. But let's say, for example, you and never in your life are going to go into a confined space. Well, obviously, you don't need to do confined space entry training because your work stated mission, we ain't going to know it's confined space. Well, I'll agree with you only so far on that. And I'll say, okay, fine. You don't need to do confined space entry training. What you should do and have a chapter in your book on is what is called confined space awareness training. The key word here being awareness. And the awareness is basically a one page little speech that says, guys, if we see a manhole and it's open and there's a hundred dollar bill at the bottom of the manhole and you can see it, I don't want you going in that manhole. And if you're going to open the door of that Connex box where we store the fertilizer and it's 100 degrees in July, I want you to wait till that box airs out before you go in there. That's called awareness training. To educate your people on what can be a confined space. Silos, vaults, any underground. Doesn't have to be underground. It can be above ground. Silos, grain elevators, any of this stuff. 
Anything that can be a confined space, you need to edge electrical vaults. We had one to go across a bridge down in the Florida Keys where our guys would freak out because they wanted to shut all the power off. And they call the guy to say, hey, come and shut the power off before we go in here. And we, you know, we'd like to see a tag on the switch. So, and the guy in the Florida Keys, he goes, ah, nah, 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 I'll stop by on my way to work. I'll stop by on my way up to the store. I'll shut it off. And they're going, oh, 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 oh. he didn't even put a tag, there's a lock, nothing. I said, well, you don't go in there until we're sure. So this is the awareness. Anyway, that's the different level. Now, there's awareness level for fall protection. Jethro, you don't go up over six feet or, or, or you'll lose your job. Six feet is the action level for fall protection. Um, certain kinds of confined space. Something that you do not plan to do. You don't have to spend a day or half day training on it. But if it's on your horizon in any shape or form, it behooves us to at least say, look, we did awareness level training on this. Think about it. When something bad happens involving this, you at least want to be able to point to, now if it's a kid at the bottom of the manhole, you know, we're going to make some decisions. You know, we, we never say never in this business, but I can tell you most people that get in trouble going in confined spaces, the guy who's in there, he's already dead. The other people that get in trouble is the would-be rescuers that try to go in and be the cavalry and the heroes. That's the number two, three fatality in the same space for the same reason. So, so awareness training, very important. Uh, um, yeah, I'm going to give you a couple of uh, uh, safety tips. Um, hot asphalt, tack coats, hot stuff. Uh, they've got this stuff out here now. It's called water gel burn blanket. There's a couple of different, that's one commercial braid. There's three or four different. That one little, they're little packets. Anybody use them? Have them on their first aid kits? Make a note, ask your first aid guy, water gel burn blankets. It is a very effective burn reduction, heat removal. It's like the reverse of antifreeze. It removes heat, cools, pacifies, de, de uh, uh, germize the burn. What do you call it? Uh, antiseptic. Yeah, for the burn. Use that in your safety meeting. It's a good topic. It raises the awareness of, of burn prevention. If you're dealing with any form of hot, what? Striking companies, thermo. Yeah. How many guys have been burned? <laughs> good, good. Well, you you bring that into your program and say, if somebody's got it right down across, you know, sensitive skin area, you put that. It not only helps uh, minimize the burn, uh, removes heat. Minimize the burn, no scarring, less <laughs> tissue loss, less pain and suffering, less of a reason that you got to report this and go through whatever. So very important. And what it does, a lot of this stuff, certain kinds of PPE and, and safety gear, it raises the awareness. That's why we say in a lot of cases, a, a more advanced program you will have a safety committee, a committee. That's the sign of a more developed, advanced, mature program where you have a committee of representative employees who rotate on and off the committee. That's the sign that an organization has reached a level of confidence. We know how to run our business safely. We can do this. We've got rules, we've got procedures, but it's an organization that has the confidence to say, we know that our best ideas are going to come not from the ivory tower, not from OSHA, not from the insurance people or whoever, they're going to come from you. The guy on the end of that show, you are going to see the hazard you're going to see the fix. You're going to see the danger. We need you to report it. We need you to say something. 
And if it's not the guy in the safety committee, you want to create the vehicle, the means for that average guy, the average new person, to be able to report it and say, he may not want to go to the boss. In fact, a lot of people are really nervous about going to the boss. Hey, listen, hey, look, I, I know you're busy, but I need you to, can you look, take a look at this? A lot of guys don't want to do that. You need to give them, the co-worker next to them, or the, 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 the means to do that informally. So when they're sitting in the truck, they go, hey man, I gotta step up on that thing again, I gotta put a hole in my foot. <coughs> the step was broken. Nobody wants to report it. If you start a committee, you do it gradually, you do it easily, you try to, what's called, incentivize the committee. And when most managers hear the word, the I word, incentivize, they get really nervous. Incentivize. How do you incentivize a safety committee? I'm going to tell you, it's really easy. You go down to Lowe's, and you know that glove rack they got at Lowe's? They got like 20 different kinds of gloves. They got hot gloves and cold gloves and double lined and thermal and pinch resistant and cut resistant. You go buy a few different types of gloves, and you take them to the safety meeting, and you give them to your two or three safety committee members. And it's like, what are these gloves for? Well, we want you to try them out because we think they're different from the ones we're using. We want you to evaluate these gloves if they're better or worse than what we're using now, because we just might buy some more if, if you guys like them. And you incentivize them, you recognize their input into your overall program by saying to them, take these $20 gloves or $10 gloves and tell me what you think. You ask them for their feedback, and the impression in their mind is, well, gloves, what are you, are you for real? The impression that you're creating to them is that, holy crap, my boss thinks enough of my feedback and input to ask for my opinion. Who's ever done that before? To actually ask a person, a worker, for their opinion. We have done this with footwear, foul weather gear, winter gear, seasonal, one time we gave the safety committee in Pensacola, Florida, we, had, we used MSA V-Guard caps, hard hats. They make a, a sun brim for that hat. Has anyone ever seen it? It's rare. It's, you really have to dig down. You find it. The vendors don't find it. They make a sun brim for that hat that effectively turns that hat into a sombrero. It's huge. And it is a huge... I bought one up in Bethesda to keep the sun off on our parking lot job. It was incredible. We gave them to the safety committee. So now these guys are out there with these big visors on the hat, and, the hat, and they were like 20 bucks a pop. And uh, it was made in Germany, I'll never forget. It was engineered to fit on that hat. And I mean, it fit on the hat. It was like a strong, and all of a sudden, this, you know, whoa, 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 whoa. I says, well, that's the, my safety committee. They're evaluating protective gear. Oh, really? Well, well, how can I get one? Well, you have to wait till they evaluate the gear. And it was like, hey, come on, me all quit screwing around. I need that. I, I said, well, I went and got this safety committee for a reason. We did that winter and summer with seasonal gear, with truck gear, with you name it, uh, jackknives and tools and gloves and PPE. But we incentivized the committee. We recognized their input. And guess who was writing all this stuff down? We had a form. Now, this was a big organization, 400 people. We had a form called Personal Protective Equipment Evaluation Form. And I got signatures from supervisors when that form went out, and it came back. And I mean, some of this was wallpaper, I admit it. But I had a file like this. No one ever made the allegation. But if anyone tried to say, you guys don't care, about your PPE or whatever, that was part of my defensive paper. I had a trailer load of this stuff. It was all electronic, so it was easy, but that's an example of how you incentivize. In other words, the reciprocal of doing that means that you have been using the same gear in the same way, the same time, the same stuff forever, and it's never changed. That's the sign of a static program. It's not moving, you not moving. The good program, we're going to try something new. 
Well, well, why are we going to do that? We got no, no, nothing's, nothing's wrong with it. Well, we don't know that. Maybe we've been lucky. How many folks have heard of the word continuous improvement? The ones, I think there's a couple of seminars on it actually in this, in this party. But that's where most programs should aim. If you want to aim for the high, highest goal is continuous improvement. It's, it sounds kind of exotic, but it's really not. It, all it means is that you talked about something that was not in the book. The number one complaint I hear about safety meetings, tailgate safety meetings, is uh, this crap is boring. It turns my guys off. It doesn't apply to them. Why do I got to do it? It means you're just picking the wrong channel to read from. You're watching Fox News. You should be watching something more intellectual. You should be picking something that's more... <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you should be picking something more. Here's another tip. This is a safety tip for you. A lot of this stuff, we all buy insurance. You call up your insurance guy and you say, hey, you, I need you to come by here next week or next month, whatever. Give them a date, place, time or, or coordinate. I need you to come by here because I'm having a safety meeting and I hear that you're an expert on defensive driving. And I've got a bunch of guys driving. I want you to come by here as my guest speaker. And, 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 and I guarantee you, the list of excuses that you will hear of why that person can't do it is going to be legendary. The moral of the story is you say, listen, you, I'm paying you a lot of money. Go find me somebody from that insurance company that can come in here and make the speech on defensive driving. I don't care if you come in, show a movie, read a book, do whatever. I just need a guest speaker in here for my meeting. Okay? What's the message to your guys? Oh, well, who's this guy? Well, I don't know, he's from the insurance company. Well, why is he here? Well, he's going to talk about defensive driving. Why, is something wrong with my driving? No, your driving's really good. We don't want anything wrong with your driving. And by the way, do what this guy says. When hopefully he's going to say, stay back from the vehicle ahead of you, if you're backing. Okay, how are we doing on time? Yeah, five more minutes, but... Well, five, two, one, it's not eight o'clock yet. We should be eight o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, he's going to come in and change his video again. Here, look, i got to write this down. i got to cover some stuff real quick. We all have time left. You need to remember this. The number one, the number one cause of the worst losses in the vehicle, get this, in the vehicle, and on the ground, the number one of all, the all time, is summarized in very, oh, he did bring me back. Feature this. The number one law, law, number one worst ever. I never, what? Them. Saw them. Thank you. Who's the genius that said that? I never saw them. Do you understand this, the implication of this? Followed by, they came out of nowhere. <laughs> Those are the two. I wish I could laugh with you. We had forensic crash investigators that worked for us. Florida Highway Patrol, 28-year veterans that taught us the lesson. That said, Miola, the number one statement, I and mean, when we did incident response, but these were not fender benders. These were multiple crashes with dismemberments and incinerations and just horrible stuff. Right here, I never saw it. the number one statement. Okay, let's try to learn from this. Let's learn very valuable lessons. Basically, two lessons you need to learn on this. Number one, our vehicles. Remember we said we're going to drive a lot. You need to remember a couple of things. Write it down. So daytime running lights. Daytime running lights. The absolute number one defensive driving, passive defensive driving measure that we will take. So daytime running lights. So if you've got them on the vehicle, they're called automatic DRLs. If not, you need to be grooming your drivers to flick the switch, okay? This makes your vehicle conspicuous 
under all lighting conditions, and depending where we live, flower, thunderstorms, daytime, whatever, we need to have this here, okay? Let's switch gears a minute because now we're not driving anymore. Now we've arrived at the job site. We're backing into the lot. We're unloading our equipment. We're moving around. We're getting into a, uh, off the city streets. What have we got now? Boots on the ground. Where's our, we're gonna bring the high vis. Who's got high vis? No high vis in here. How many folks are using ANSI? Class, whatever. What? Vests. The technical name is high visibility apparel. There is an ANSI standard. It's actually ANSI slash ISEA, International Safety Equipment Association. The people that make this stuff have a very strict standard. It's constantly being improved. You, the, the rule we're going to follow on this is real simple. The more the better. There's minimum standards, it comes in classes, class uh, uh, one, two, three, and then they switch. Class one is for low speed, Walmart parking lot, the guy that pushes the carts, he's got the little three panel vest, throw them away. If you got them in your house, don't get rid of them. The minimum you need is class two, preferably class three, which is kind of a pain because you got a little bulk of a garment, you got sleeves, class three, but the rule to remember is the more the better. The, at the end of the day, the reason you do this is so that you do not become party to this. You do not become the victim of this. For the vehicle, you have the headlights. For the person on the ground, you have the high visibility of power. <clears throat> Sometimes people ask, why can't I put bright lights on my person to make them more conspicuous? Because there is a rule that says you should not, you can't do it on a highway setting. Now in a parking lot, private job, off-site, maybe you can. Um, it follows the function of ergonomics that the human eye is light seeking. It is attracted to light. In the vehicle, the headlights define this. The headlights define your vehicle. Not that it's a Chevy pick em up truck or whatever. It shows that it's a, a pinpoint of light at a quarter of a mile away, you can see it easily. The same reciprocal is for the, the human body with the high visibility. And the reason we say class two minimum, class three preferably, if it's at night, class E, which is full body, pantaloons, uh, uh, upper body and, and in mo as many cases as possible, hard hat with the reflective decals, load up on this stuff because you do not want to become victimized of this category. So visibility, that's why they say for the spotters directing vehicles backing to stay in clear areas, that's why they say for uh, uh, highway work zone workers to stay, how many folks are working public highways? Not many, okay, not many, but the ones that are, you know this because there's a DOT standard and there's a MUTCD, but if you're in private, then I can tell you a lot of bad stuff happens in residential, driveways, parking lots, uh, um, pets, the, the family pet, the, the kids leaving bikes behind cars. I mean, not a month goes by that we don't read a horror story. Anyway, so here's what we've got. Uh, we can skip through this a little bit of uh, OSHA stuff. Um, avoidance, we've talked about the uh, uh, state uh, circadian rhythms right here. If we're doing night work, night work, we want to pay attention to what's called circadian rhythms. You, you need to get, it's a different kind of sleep during the day. The REM sleep is different. Hydration, diet, a lot of things affect night work and fatigue factors, and supervisory awareness, and, and uh, night work very, uh, very much more demanding. Not that it's more physically demanding, but our senses are dulled, our perception is off, uh, you know, there's a lot of different factors, if it's seasonal, uh, but circadian rhythm is very, very important. Um, Giving your guys time off overnight, I mean, the workers love a double shift. I work 24 straight hours, we push snow for 36 hours straight. I've seen all of it. And my 
guys that work for me, I said, you absolutely will not work for me for more than 12 hours. You will go home and you will sleep. Why? I can keep going. I got coffee, blah, blah. I said, I'm not coming home to tell your family, I made you work 24 hours and you fell asleep and killed yourself or 10 other people. Right? But they'll do it. Especially, you know, the ones yeah, that will work yeah, hard. Yeah. So I'll do it. I'll do a double yeah. shift. Don't do uh, it. Coffee, Red Bull, any of that stuff, worst ever. Hydration is water, juice, tea, lemonade. Hydration is hydration. Uh, it's not Red Bull, it's not energy drinks. Coffee only works so far. Um, anyway, if we're doing that, you know, and you can Google it and see. There's a lot of different websites that talk about it. Uh, traffic controls should be present. Defensive paper, remember? Traffic controls should be present even in private parking lots, the bank, the Walmart. Traffic controls should be there. Think about it. People's impression, when we drive off that city street, hey, I'm in the Walmart parking lot. Customer's king. Customer can do no wrong. This is Walmart. This is Home Depot. This is Target. This is work. I'm in charge. I can drive the way I want. I can do whatever. You, if you're working there, you need to protect yourself. Signage, cones, barrel, something that says, look, well, look what I did, look what we, all the protective stuff we have. So that's why most people have the impression to say, no, I'm not on a public street, I don't need it. You do need it. You do have to put it out there. Even if it's off spec, at least you've got some of it. Go ahead, Dean. Any questions? We're going to be nearing the end of our prayer session. How many folks have questions? Everybody's an expert on safety? That's pretty good. What else? Okay, right here. Here's some of the links. These are the links that go back to those websites uh, that we mentioned, either state uh, websites or uh, bilingual, English, Spanish. Uh, and as we mentioned, Cal I think it's California, Florida, Texas A&M, uh, University, uh, what was the other one? New York. Uh, the four that I found most prominent with their translation of safety materials. So if we have Hispanic workers, that's a usually a pretty good place to start. Uh, some have videos, and there's more coming all the time because the workers come. Oh, uh, one thing before I forget, uh, temporary labor. Temporary labor, very popular. Very popular as a pressure relief device. We need some people in. Uh, I've got companies that actually have formed their own temp labor organizations in order to staff some of their projects. Because their insurance rate is low, because they don't have to go through a lot of rigmarole adding benefits and hiring and firing and insurance, et cetera, et cetera. However, OSHA has now identified temporary labor operations as a focus point for regulatory. If you run a temporary labor place, you had best be doing some safety training and education before you send that person out. If we hire temporary labor, OSHA has found that if there's going to be, if let's say if something bad happens and there's an accident, the people that are going to get the citation from OSHA Instead of just the employer who would be the temp labor guy, now it's going to come to both. They're going to cite both the employer and the hiring group for either failure to train or whatever they can find for that OSHA thing. And there's usually a fine attached to it. You can argue the fine, you can get it reduced, but it's a lot of headache. You can avoid all that by doing the training up front, making sure that if you use temp labor, it's like, hey, have you guys done safety training for your employees? And they're usually going to say, yes, we have, but we have not done specific training in your line of work. How many folks use temp labor? I mean, if that's an issue. Okay, it's not, it doesn't seem to be a lot, but bear it in mind that the responsibility does not end just because you rented that out for the day. If you bring them in, you should have a little line, line of somewhere, somewhere, person was given a modified safety orientation, you covered the basics, they're obviously not going to be running equipment or driving fleet or driving backing up trucks, but if they're going to be shoveling, you at least talked about PPE, wearing the vest, 
you know, don't hurt your back when you're shoveling. Don't don't step in the hot asphalt. Whatever. Uh, any questions so far? We have covered a lot. Normally, the information we've covered would have been a four-hour, half-day safety seminar. <clears throat> so we condensed it into an hour and a half. In other words, my vocal cords are going to be on vacation for the next two weeks. <laughs> are there any questions?